The following is an interview with the composer Brian Fernieho. It was recorded via Zoom on Wednesday, February 10th, 2021, and released one week later. During the interview, we had some bandwidth problems, which resulted in less than optimal video and sound quality. Because of the considerable interest this interview has generated, I asked my video editor if he could somehow improve it. And I think the following video is much easier to watch and to listen to. For those purists out there who must absolutely see the original version, it is still available on my YouTube page. Please remember to hit the notification bell and like this video so that you won't miss any of my future content. And I hope you enjoy this discussion with Brian Fernieho. I'm extremely honored to present today a very special interview with Brian Fernieho, who needs absolutely no introduction. Brian, thank you very much for doing this. It's very good to see you. Sure. I wanted to start this off with a somewhat general question about your work. It seems to me that a lot of your music has grotesque or humoristic or paradistic elements. And there are instances in some of your pieces that are actually quite funny. I'm thinking of things, for example, such as the cello cadenza in the string trio. There are aspects of shadow time that are also, I think, quite funny. There are things in the recent umbrations cycle, such as the piece for double bass and string quartet. Uh, for which these sorts of descriptors come to mind. This is something that is very seldom commented upon uh, when your work is discussed. I wonder if you have any particular thoughts about that and how important that aspect might be to you. Well, it's interesting you do mention this, first of all, because it is in fact true that very few people comment upon it. And some of it's very easy to see in, in Shadow Time. The text will give you a guide sometimes to the musing bits. Um, it, it's something that has grown over the years, I think. I wouldn't say that before 1990, maybe, um, it played a big role. But I think since then, I've, I've become a little bit more open to, I wouldn't say external influences, but to those aspects of the human expressive uh, capability, which are a little bit off, shall we say. Why do I do it? I don't know. I think almost any one of my pieces does it. I wrote this little piece this year uh, for the Ensemble Moderne. They'd asked for pieces for, in some way, re referring to Christmas, because they had a Christmas concert. And I wrote, I wrote a piece. It was about 16, 18 measures long. And it clearly, it was beautifully orchestrated, because you had to use all the players. So I used all the, uh, the 12 uh, sustaining instruments in two, in two voices. It was very nice. And then the two percussion and piano playing stones taken from the riverbed. And it, it just seemed to me to represent for me a little bit of a, not exactly humorous, but certainly s somewhat snide view of what, what was available to us at the present time. <laughs> They'd asked for 40 pieces, and so every one of us uh, one and three quarter minute piece, whatever it was. And um, I, I changed my style totally just to do this one little piece. It was quite amusing. Well, there's an element of exaggeration in humor. And that seems to be an aspect of your music that has been present from the start. And when you push things uh, to a certain point in a given direction, you know, it, it, be it becomes a matter of exaggeration. And I wonder if, if the sort of uh, paradistic or, uh, you know, the, the sort of extreme sorts of expression that result from that uh, were for you allied with some kind of a humoristic potential, even before 1990, let's say. Well, sometimes I had to have a good sense of humor in order to put up with the performance that, that I got, if you believe that. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I don't know. I, it, it's, an, it's, it's just something that's come more to the front in recent years, it's, it's, I've, I've eased into it rather than going into it in any particular, with any particular conscious attempt to change the basic emotional syntax, shall we say, of my music. But it is true that sometimes I've given myself problems to solve, which are not solvable in normal terms. And so one has to, one has to apply that to something else. The grotesque was the word you mentioned before, and I think there is certainly the attitude of grotesque in parts of um, the the um, Piranesi cycle. 
Caccetti did Vincione, because that's precisely what Piranesi was doing, of course, was taking normal perspectives and normal objects and putting them in a totally different perspectival context. And that seemed to me something which interested me very much because I was interested in perspective from a musical point of view. One of the problems with a lot of contemporary music, it seemed to me, is that although it's, it's written on a lot of levels, it all comes out on one level. And so I was interested to see what would, ha what would happen if one tried deliberately to, um, to compose in perspectival distinctions between, between layers, sometimes self-contradictory ones. And I think on the whole, that's worked quite well. So yes, um, I used to call it manneristic music. And of course, the word mannerism doesn't quite apply to it historically, but it's a good word to hold on to. Um, I'm interested in maniera, in the way in which a thing changes from being the thing it is to being a new thing by being proposed. Which a thing which is capable of being proposed, or a thing which per se demands to be proposed. I wonder if you could elaborate on this idea of, of sort of multiple perspectival energies in a piece, as opposed to what you saw at the time in contemporary music, uh, a kind of, I'm not going to, I'm not going to uh, put words in your mouth, but the the idea that there is something almost flat about it, or it, it doesn't come across as being uh, uh, multipolar or or multi-level when you hear the piece, even though it might have been composed that way. Uh, how do you think that sort of um, uh, flatness, if you want to call it that, uh, may have may have arisen? Oh, I think it probably arose because people were concerned with other, other aspects of compositional technique. Um, some, some of them were involved in, in extreme length. Some, were, some of them were involved in uh, extreme simplicity, as it might be. And some of them, indeed, like Ligeti, were involved with all sorts of um, uh, magical parlor tricks in order to make things function in different ways than the way in which they were written, or to be perceived in different ways the way they were written. There's the movement of the second string quartet, which um, it is quite apropos of that, which is that um, it starts off with an incredible scrabbly uh, chromatic uh, uh, line, which is in some ways a parody of some hyper expressionistic, maybe, quartets or other textures. But it's still, it gradually slows down. And as it gradually slows down, you begin to notice that it isn't a set of figures, it isn't a set of motives which are being polyphonically posed against each other, it's one single chromatic line. And I think that's very, very interesting. If we can hear in, in music, um, if we can be led up one path and pull ourselves back by the ear across another path, I think that's fascinating. And I try to do that on many occasions, that a thing that um, when it first appears, might seem quite um, not terribly important, might seem incidental. But if you re-parse that and redefine that and package it differently over the space of a few minutes, you find that it becomes something central to the discourse and you don't remember that it wasn't there in the first place. I think music is very good for that. I mean, many of the other art forms that are not concerned with time as such don't specifically deal with that. And I have always tried to build it into my pieces, um, what should we, how should we put it, faulty memory, that we remember something. We all know that. We, we all have memories which in some way define us as people, as individuals. But if we were to go back to the time, or if documentary evidence arose, which would be equivalent to that, we usually find it was nothing like we remembered it. We've built stories around it. We've accreted ourselves in ways that suit, suit us. And um, we pay no attention anymore. Well, we can't, in fact, to what actually took place. It's happened to me quite a lot. So I think in music, this is one of the aspects of composition which interests me the most. Uh, what is it that one hears at the beginning of a piece in terms of the ordering of things, how many different things and so on? Uh, how do I know what is a thing? It, uh, we might have a, a glissando. Well, yes, but is it a glissando which has a certain breadth? Is it played for a certain tone color? 
uh, we don't know at that particular point, and we're trying to build up stories for ourselves from these min this minimal scattering of information. And as the piece goes on, some of these things take on uh, a sort of magisterial status. They become things which, by redefining perhaps verbally or conceptually what these things are, we find that they can do many different things that at the beginning was not in their capability. So uh, that's not quite the same as perspective, but it is um, it is something that I've very often in my in my music done. I thought, oh, simple case would be um, you have a rhythmic structure at the very, very beginning of a piece. You don't know it's a rhythmic structure until it's somewhat later, but when it occurs later, then later. Um, it's it's um, doubled or varied or embellished in various ways, which show that different parts of that rhythmic structure fulfil uh, different notional purposes. In my mind, at least, in writing the piece, which wasn't the case at the beginning, and so at the beginning we had something that was very flat and. We could very easily hear what it was, perhaps the chords or whatever else is going on. But as it goes on, we find that it becomes destabilized by little, little secondary definitions or ways of looking at things being poked into the fabric. And that is fascinating to me. It's, it sounds like in part what you're describing is a situation in which you initially are exposed very rapidly to a large amount of material that may be disordered. It might not be obvious what the priorities mm -hmm. are within the material. And then gradually, if you're listening carefully as the piece unfolds, you start to see segments or fragments of this initial opening gesture or material that start to reveal themselves and unfold. And it, it sort of plays upon the, the listener's memory in that sense. It activates yeah. uh, a kind of latent memory. Well, what is memory then? What are things? What is what is material? Um, if we take my piece, La Chute du Car, for instance, the clarinet doing these ridiculously stupid microtonal scales, um, we see as the piece progresses, these scales are eaten away. That either other pictures come to replace original ones, or more likely silence. So that the uh, original scalar structure is eaten away, broken into, and through these silences, or absences probably better to say, uh, other things can poke through, which at the, at the, the beginning would perhaps might not have been present. But we, we leave space for things to happen that the destruction of the original material uh, makes possible. Yeah, it's it's completely fascinating. I, I agree. I mean, La Chute Car is an interesting example of that because it's 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 a fairly rare example of what could almost be described as a sort of unipolar linear process in one of your pieces, uh, and one also that's placed at the very beginning of the work. So it's it's particularly uh, evident. Yes. Well, I was looking at the time to uh, both for this gradual erosive process, although at the beginning I didn't know entirely how that would work but also um, for a multi-layer temporal expansion of this figure by uh, the other instruments that are playing, playing exactly the same notes as the clarinet is, but at different times. And so we get a sort of uh, balloon of supportive warm air, keeping the clarinet part running, even when it gets into incredibly microtonal zone. So, um, that was really very primitive, and I was very worried at the beginning of that piece, what the hell I was doing. Uh, why, why am I doing something which is so obviously the case? But of course, again, that simplicity gives rise to a highly differentiated or potentially differentiated um, mode of listening when these, when these elements occur again in different conjunctions. Yeah, I wonder if we could use that as a, a jumping off point to discuss harmony for a second, because you mentioned these sort of frozen um, spectra at the at the outset mm -hmm. of uh, of Le Chute Well, It's not exactly a spectrum, but at least there's a there's a kind of microtonal scale 
uh, that it's is, a microtonal uh, scale. Yeah. It's a microtonal the upward scale. The version is different than the, down, the downward version, but only slightly. Right, but it's it's reverberated in a sense. There are, there are pitches from that opening gesture that are prolonged and elaborated upon by the other uh, oh, yes, instruments. Oh yes, absolutely, absolutely. It's a, it's an, an amazingly old technique, but it still functions sometimes. Right, and it was it was my idea to take something that's amazingly not primitive but amazingly obvious and first of all have it eyeball to eyeball with us at the beginning of the piece a strange sort of je ne sais pas quoi and then as the piece goes on by this thing disappearing by it being broken up all sorts of lower layers come into existence it's rather like um oh in uh, Borges, we find a, a story where uh, an emperor asked for a map of his kingdom made so detailed that it was exactly the same size as the kingdom. You know the story. Yes. And um, then, of course, in later centuries, uh, people crossing this desert came across fragments of this map strewn everywhere, bits of parchment and so on. Because, of course, by making it the same size as the kingdom, the sun had been occluded and nothing was able to grow there. So we have to decide what is an effective focus, degree of focus for a certain sort of process. There's something not exactly similar because it's it's a different sort of process, but at the opening of the string trio, there's also a, a, a sort of frozen spectrum in which the notes are uh, disposed in a kind of a microtonal uh, mm -hmm. spectrum uh, in, in the opening viola solo. And First of all, I wonder if for you there's a connection between those two opening gestures. And secondly, uh, it does open up once again the, the, the notion of harmony, because when you have a certain degree of pitch repetition at the same octave, and when this happens uh, fairly mm -hmm. consistently over a certain amount of time, it does create uh, a consistency of harmonic focus, let's say, uh, which I think is present in the opening of both of those works. So I wonder, first That's of true. all, yes. do, do, do you hear these things harmonically? Uh, is that how they manifest to you? And and do you see Well, not as a those? functional harmony. I, I hear the repeated notes. I can predict more with more or less certitude when the next note will come and what pitch it is. Um, and I have a guarantee that there is a, a curtain behind which, what's happening, although I don't, in fact, repeat the notes in other instruments. Nevertheless, uh, because the music at the beginning is so quiet, you're forced to listen to the notes really very closely indeed, um, we get a feeling that they are gradually beginning to move the space between them in a, cer a certain sort of subjective fashion. And of course, the figurations that exist in the viola solo at the beginning, it's clear that they are not figurations because the, the intervals between them, uh, the actual pictures themselves, which are very peculiar. Obviously, they are extracted from something. And I think that, that um, again, is, a, is a, a sort of hint about what the piece is doing at that moment. Well, it, it strikes me also that the, the particular pitches that you've chosen and the way that you've chosen to place them uh, in the register is, a, is an interesting example of something you've described on several occasions in interviews where you've talked about the importance of always bearing in mind the sort of tactile, uh, what would you call it, sort of uh, almost the pragmatic uh, dimension of, of playing any instrument and writing mm -hmm. for a particular instrument, where a lot of the uh, the high pitches in the viola part, which, which sounds quite disjunctive, are, are actually quite easy to play, natural harmonics, um, third harmonics, and so on. Uh, and so the solo, which sounds incredibly disjunctive, is actually, it, it, it fits rather well under the fingers. Yeah, I think that the, the player himself hears it as conjunct, even over silences or uh, over wide intervals. And the figurations of rhythmic structure, which I'm using, I try to use them to embody forth the, the size of the intervals that are being played at the same time. Another piece comes to mind is my, my little Adagissimo from 1983, where the two violins have, a, have a, um, a spectrum and they share it. And they don't play anything except notes from that spectrum from beginning to end. But on the other hand, no textual or rhythmic figure actually repeats. So it, you, in a way you don't hear what the pitches are doing. 
whereas the viola and the cello are doing long notes, which actually include things like sixth tones and approximations, what shall I say, approach approximations towards other tones. And therefore, they give us a, a wave-like motion, whereas the activity of the two violins, of course, is, is frozen, even though the figures are always very violinistic, I think, precisely because they can't change the pitches. And they're all semitones. Anyway. I do think of what pitch does in a piece, uh, but sometimes I don't think of it only in the ways that one would normally think of pitch in a piece. I think it's, it's uh, interlocked with other aspects of the music at that particular point in a way which, which doesn't say, is this a C-sharp or is this a G-sharp? Yeah, I, I'm extremely interested in that question, actually, because one of the things that seems clear as you look at the evolution of harmony within Western music from the late 19th century onwards is that uh, all sorts of parameters that up to that point you might argue had been secondary or almost absent from the musical discourse become, well, they're, they're almost on, a, on an equal footing uh, with pitch and rhythm. And uh, you start to see, obviously, functional harmony uh, becomes less and less important, less and less an arbiter of, uh, of directionality and, and forward motion in music. Uh, but also color and gesture and all of these other things become extraordinarily important. So I wonder if one could say then, uh, with respect to your own work, that pitch is sort of subsumed within a higher order uh, type of material that might be the, the gesture or the shape or the curve or something of that order. Yes, that's absolutely true. Um, I think I wrote about it at one time where the, uh, uh, in which I talked about figure in one of my articles. And a figure is something, it's not just a gesture. A gesture is a, is a recognizable concatenation or whatever. But a figure is something that implies its own deconstruction into smaller perceptual moments. Like if you have, I don't know, three violent arpeggios on the, on, on the first violin. Uh, only one pitch remains constant from first chord to the second, and the second chord to the third is a different one. So one's dealing there with delay, one's dealing there with anticipation, one's dealing there with a notional larger frame within which these things will be disposed. It's interesting about pitch. I've, like most composers, I've sought over the years to find means of, of reasonably articulating to myself what pitch does. Um, in my last big piece, De, De Ira, for, violet, for um, organ, uh, perhaps we can look at this will be more the grotesque moment, because in this piece, I establish a single evolutional process for whatever pitches and then i choose random pitches within a certain limit obviously so one of these figurations might be i don't know it might have five of the notes of g major in it one of them might have uh, they don't have octaves but they could have uh, uh, another of them will build a scale but they are all treated by this particular technique of permutation which allows me to start off with an unordered set of these notes, moving towards an ordered set where we perceive what their ordering principle is. So what's the material in the piece? It's constantly changing every, couple, every few measures. I've got a new random sequence of, of features, but they are all treated in the same way. Right, that relates to the, the random funneling idea, presumably. It is indeed. You, you remember correctly. It's, it's, this piece takes that to a radical extreme. So you might have three notes, four notes, and they very quickly come out into the whatever order. Usually I choose an ascending form of the pitches. So we can see, you know, it's finished. You find in um, La Chutica also in the clarinet part, there are things which do that, which is the first piece I use this particular technique in. And it was fascinating to, to not have to scratch my head as about about what pictures to put to this particular technique because um i didn't decide on them basically i know it sounds a bit john cajun but it's not it's just a question of trying to foreground the technique foreground the unraveling process above what is being unraveled yeah it's it's extremely interesting it's also interesting in the sense that you can you can sort of insert whatever material you want into a process of that sort since it's 
it sounds like what you're what you're saying, and tell me if I've got this wrong, but it sounds like the process is more important than the the identity of the particular pitches that you're using. Okay. Well, if you take my fourth quartet, let, let, let me just give a different example, yes? Yeah, sure. Uh, the, 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 the pitches themselves are really produced in a quite rigorous way. There are a series of fourths, uh, which are transposed in different ways, and they go on for quite a long time, the, the particular unfolding mechanism involved. But I do not say in which order these chords, uh, the, 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 the notes of any one of these chords are to be heard. So it could well be that I have a group of four notes, da 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 da, which if you unfold them, you find it's actually staggered perfect fifths. We get back to this case of Ligeti again, of course. I was very interested at the time to see the sort of things one could do with this unfolding and unraveling process. In the fourth quartet, what happened was mostly that I orchestrated the four pictures available to me at that particular moment in such a way that they would or would not reveal their engenderment. Sometimes it's just an, a group of pictures spaced between um, instruments, yeah? But sometimes I put them all in one instrument and you can hear the, the actual figuration where they're derived from. And I thought that was a good way of orchestrating harmony, if you like. It also relates to me to something that seems to be happening with increasing frequency in your more recent work, which is the integration of materials that you could describe as being heterogeneous. So in other words, materials that might happily exist in a completely different stylistic context. I'm thinking of things like the triads that appear in the last part of Opus Contra Naturum. Uh, obviously, totally non-functional triads, but triads nevertheless. Mm -hmm. Uh, and in uh, the more recent I think, canopies, I think you mean the second, second movement. Sorry, second, the second movement. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Or in the more recent piece, Quirrell, where you have these sort of Listian, quasi-Listian octaves that occur in that piece, uh, which uh, which I found extremely interesting. Well, all very processual. I mean, I'm working basically with five notes at a time. There, those are five related semitones. And the only thing that there is them in the course of the piece is the order in which they're played. Five, one, three, four, two, or five, four, three, one, two. You hear different sorts of repulsion or attraction of the notes to their engendering figure. Yeah, you see, it's like when I was at school, we all had to do these horrible science lessons and put a bit of iron filings on a sheet, stick a magnet in the middle, and you get this, you get these wonderful shapes, yes. Isn't very nice, yes. Uh, and so in this particular case, I thought, in, in Quirrell particularly, that um, I would be extremely limited in, in terms of the things I allowed myself to do. And you can get things like third, parallel third, second, whatever. But it's all, it's all permutation, of course, that. But do you do you reflect upon the affective qualities of these materials when they appear in the piece, and the, and the fact that they they? You mean they're not effective? Um, <laughs> yes, I do. Yes, I do. Um, oft, often, what, what I'm saying is, it... what I'm saying is, I'm sorry. There's a bit of a lag, so if I interrupt you, it's not intentional. Uh, if, uh, in other words, these are these are not neutral materials, right? They they have they have historical connotations and stylistic connotations and so on. That's correct. However, generally speaking, I don't use them with respect to their historical connotations. You might say in uh, umbrations that several of the movements, uh, which are stand in quite close relationship to the Christopher Tye bio consort pieces, do that. But in general, I, you know, I'm not Maxwell Davis. <laughs> uh, I don't, I don't use historical materials with a, with a way to uh, to authenticate in present day compositional technique on the basis of historical precedent. I don't do that. If you listen to the last part of Umbrations, um, the, the Christopher Tye four-part fantasy, which upon the in nomine from which this movement is based, is simply played in the steel drums. The treble starts, play the whole treble, then the alto, then the tenor, then the bass. And as it happens, of course, as you go down, they have fewer and fewer pitches and fewer and fewer rhythms. So uh, you get quite an, an interesting filtering effect in that way. I don't see that particularly as evoking in any way 
anything, except that it does seem in that particular m movement, there is a certain sort of nostalgia because of the, the, the predominantly tonal intervals in the, in the tie itself, the rhythms aren't anything like that. Um, and that enables us, uh, because I'm using these four parts successively, there's a process involved with that, statistical one. Uh, there is a layer which is playing, in fact, the, on the electric organ, the cantosermus itself. And there is a layer in which all the other instruments participate, which, is, which uses chords produced very much in the way as we've been discussing, that they're chords which um, may be built up of two or three different ways of relating intervals. So I might say, okay, the top three notes uh, do this, the second three notes do that, and the bottom five notes do that. And then the next time, five will come in the middle, and three, and three at the bottom. So I think it worked that this business of, of perspective we were talking about earlier works in this particular case because the materials are so obviously distinct, but that they have, because of the, the, the measure length structure, uh, the place where the dynamics in the tutis change, and other such arcana, um, they seem to have an attraction, mutual attraction, which doesn't let us pull them apart, even though they're totally different. Yeah, it seems to me that on that level, the pitch material in, in something like the Umbration Cycle, uh, or Quarrel, or other more recent pieces, is more stratified, or it's more uh, processually or functionally uh, articulated than it might have been the case in some of your earlier pieces. So if I take something like Lemma Icon Epigram, which contains some extraordinarily complex chords, but the material in that is not really functionally separated out in the same way. Richard Troop wrote a good, good article on this one. I, I read it and I said, no, oh, didn't I do that? <laughs> it was uh, the main issue with the, at least the first part of Lemma Icon Epigram was taking the linear flow of things and breaking them up into distinct layers of gestural energy balls or quanta. And so, yes, there are a tremendous number of basic techniques in the first part of that piece, but um, I use them in a rather straightforward way that, oh, I don't know, fifth technique, left hand, five notes, at least a major third apart, or something like that. I'm just making it up. But there is no overriding system which can be utilized in order to predict which of these elements will come next in the cycle, which of these elements will be used to map out others, perhaps. There's only one point in the piece where all the techniques, however many they are, all the techniques occur rapidly, one after another, in a sort of helter-skelter motion. I suppose you'd think that would be amusing. It was one of my early amusing versus. <laughs> But it sounds as though pitch in in many of these pieces is sort of radically defunctionalized in a certain sense. It's it's it almost doesn't function as pitch. Uh, it functions in a, in a in a in a different way. Oddly enough, I wouldn't take it to that extreme. I don't think. Uh, I'm often surprised by how coherent I think the actual pitch is taken as pitches in my music sound, and I'm quite happy about that. I think they shouldn't not sound like that. I think the other aspect. <clears throat> so much foregrounded in a way that perhaps most composers don't do that we tend to push their actual pitch relationship to one side in order to look to see how they're embedded in the cross currents of layering yeah well it, it, i mean it seems to me that the the pitch aspects per se i, I mean they're, they're not really commented upon very much commentators certainly have written about uh, the processes that you use to to order pitch materials and to distort them and so on and how they might evolve over a piece, but they don't speak of them really in terms of vertically sounding aggregates and their harmonic qualities. I would argue also that in your own writings, that doesn't really seem to come up very often, although I, maybe I've got that wrong. I don't do that. Um, uh, of course, over the years, I found doing formal issues and rhythmic structuring and instrumental subdivisions and so on, far more um, immediate to my ear than the actual pictures that come. However, once I decide upon um, those, then I can concentrate upon what pitch aggregates and pitch identities 
are meant to mean in a given piece. They don't all mean, one can't lay them all out flat on a table and say, oh, this one is like that 15 years later. Um, I try to think what the piece is about, and then I try to create harmonic or pitch patterns which in some way can be modified according to those recognition criteria. Well, look at a piece like In Conjunction, one of the last ensemble pieces. There's a whole section of 60-something measures in which everybody is playing P, 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 and I say in the score, if you can hear yourself play and you're too loud. <laughs> um, yeah, so you've got all these squudgy things, and each measure has a different one. But what's working there is an analysis of these squudgy things in, uh, in respect of layer, in respect of what it belongs to. Does this pitch recur after two measures, for instance, at exactly the same octave? What do we do about that? And so it's a sort of orchestration of proposed transparency in terms of, ah, oh, yes, uh, in this particular chord, there are a lot of low notes, but there are about five or six high notes, and they form a lovely little aura. And nothing to change, no dynamics, nothing. And so what we hear is the A, the effort of playing quietly, which is quite considerable, and B, the way I want these individual chords, the way I perceive of them in their, in their layering, in their hierarchies. To be perceived by other people. I mean, one of the things that's always enormously impressed me has been the extraordinary variety of uh, formal strategies and the different ways that you can create a discourse and a piece. It also seems to me that you, you, you don't do the same thing twice. So every piece is a sort of a attempt at finding a new way of creating new uh, new formal energies and, and new, new ways of patterning a piece. And I do find that enormously impressive. Thank you, but you know, um, it can also have a downside, which is you see, you, one, one day or another you run out of strategies. I, I, I do think that some of my pieces belong together, not in cycles, although I've worked on cycles, of course, but some of the other pieces, they try to get a different take on a core group of issues. And so they might, on the surface of it, seem quite different form, but at the same time, the piece that I wrote before, or the piece before that, in some way plays into the piece that I'm writing at the moment. And I suppose that's a fault in the sense that only I know that's happening. It is something that over the course of, say, 10 years, I can follow back certain things. You know, it's often the case that you invent something and you're very proud of having the invention, the sort of uh, super canonic structure or something like that or it's just a, a type of sound. And then in the piece after that, sometimes that particular percept enters into and elements the actual middle ground of the piece, that it's, it's become more consistent, it's become more defining in terms of how we perceive everything else. And then in a, a third piece, maybe, you find that that thing has basically disappeared altogether. There is still a trace of it but it's no longer at the center of things, maybe just one layer of something going on. And that doesn't seem to me to be wrong. I think it's, it's one reason to listen to people's compositions in the order in which they were written. It's fine. We should do that sometimes. Not every piece is as successful as others, I would hasten to add, regarding my own music, that I know when I've gone wrong. And um, most of the music doesn't do that. When I've sometimes felt I ought to, ought to take a leap into the dark somewhere, the leap into the dark is usually a, a manure heap because um, <laughs> I'm not sufficiently, I'm just not sufficiently familiar with the, the, the means of decomposing uh, and, and recomposing, if you like, which such environments provide. And so, yes, you, you get a change, but that change doesn't maybe live up to the what you would expect in such a change to consist of. And I don't mind admitting that. I'm an old guy. I won't be around forever. It's been more in recent years that I've found that the continuity 
of technique, uh, pitch material, form, and background concept, which has often been there a very weighty issue, has not been so strongly emphasized that things I've written in recent years have, yes, they've had their sinful issues, primarily musical issues. And um, earlier I felt that maybe in the 70s and 80s, that music was an amazing communicative medium because it showed us all aspects of what being might be. Uh, transitive, intransitive, uh, transparent, opaque, rhetorical, poetic, and all, all these different aspects can be transformed into one another. And I think in recent years, mm, perhaps I wrote a few too many big pieces. <laughs> but some of them, I think, some of them I say, oh, yeah. And so what, what else can we do? Well, that goes along with a certain degree of playfulness, I would think, you know, in, in the sense that, I mean, this would this would seem on the surface to be a very strange comparison, but if you look at the late works of Elliot Carter, he's at a point where he's willing to try almost anything once. And a lot of a lot of the techniques that he'd elaborated very painstakingly throughout the 1960s be, sort of sink down to a, an almost unconscious level. He doesn't have to think about them anymore. And the pieces take on an almost improvisatory quality. I think that's probably true, but they also they also lose something in in um whilst they gain something in that particular smoothness, they lose or consistency, they lose something in depth, I think. And the pieces of the 60s and 70s, I think, are really very good pieces. All we can say is that music belongs in its age. We can't do anything different than write music which couldn't be written any other time. Even if we're trying to imitate somebody's style, uh, we can't do it except in our own terms. And so, yeah, we maybe it's a fault of just at a certain point in life, one loses interest in some sorts of justifying moods of thinking. And that I felt that in the 60s, and, well, forget the 60s, the 70s and 80s, I got very irritated that, um, that music didn't seem to relate to anything outside itself. And uh, apart from perhaps the political, which I didn't interest me. And then, uh, so I felt in, uh, it was important to bring into music, if not necessarily into the sound, although perhaps that, bring into music the, the type of thought dynamics, the, the type of environmental sweep of one's, of, of historical thinking of a certain sort, and trying to, trying to make the music react to that. And if, perhaps in recent years, that's no longer been the case. The history of music is, is dotted with these occasional pieces, and there, there, there's very few of them, where uh, I think you can say that like, there's a kind of a category of piece that in, re in respect to its time, notably oversteps the bounds of what you might call compositional decency at a given time. Right? It, it just goes way off the spectrum. Uh, I'm thinking of things such as the Ives Fourth Symphony. Perhaps Gruppen is an example of this sort of thing. Maybe the Mahler Eight in its own time, or, or the Gurlieder, or maybe the, the Fünfelkästchen mm -hmm. mm -hmm. of, of Schönberg. But these pieces are wildly out of phase with the norms of compositional practice at their time. And it seems to me that a work like Peratonum is an example of this as well. I wonder, first of all, how you would imagine such a lineage. I mean, if, if, you, would, if you would view things in that way. And whether this sort of gargantuan ambition is something that you can, you can will. No, I think it's something that you've got. You can't will it. You may, you may feel you need it, in which case, you know, you can dig out bits of yourself that approximate it. Um, I, how long did I write that piece? About three and a half years. And there was no real reason to do it from a practical point of view, from the point of view of the music world. Nobody wanted it. Same had been true with Fire Cycle Beta eight, seven years before that. I don't know. My ideal was to write in those days, that may sound naive, to write a piece of music which hoisted itself up by its own bootlaces. That is, the, the means to listening to the piece are contained in the piece itself. We're not analyzing stylistic discrepancies or um, other things of that nature. What we're doing is simply listening to what the music is doing, and then the music is doing what it's supposed to do. And La Terre de Nome, I understood that not everything was going to be audible, although what, what audible is, I don't know, all the time. But it 
did what I wanted it to do. And if I'd not not have done that, I might as well throw throw myself out of the window. So it, sometimes we just do get these things. I've had these things also in, at other times. Um, uh, Tertsley Skype was another case when I was trying to relate the length of the section or disrelate the length of the section to the things contained within it. And uh, that's what, 26 minutes. And so it's a series of non, non sequiturs. And that's very, very difficult to do, particularly if you, well, I, I didn't do it linearly, but if you do do it linearly, I can imagine, oh, I've got to have another section with two clarinets and trombone. You know, you've, you've got the segment, the, the, the systems you're using throw up these instrumental combinations and you have to find something to do with them. And at a certain point, the piece doesn't live up to your own needs with respect to feeding and watering. But then it was true in those days that, um, uh, that I was very interested in the idea of, of does material fulfill its form or its form external to material? Is time in particular a separate dimension, which isn't just some span of clock time within which something happens, but is actually an element of the music which you can, you can actually audibly relate or disrelate to what is otherwise going on. I was thinking that a few weeks ago when I heard overtone singing. There was a, a woman who could sing the bass, uh, 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 I don't know, and go up like about five octaves into a whistle, whistling. And yes, it will be, we know that that happens, but it's quite striking um, because it all emerges from that one technique, but it sounds so totally different. And so sometimes by using a constant technique over unconstant or the discrepant materials you can it's like going going on the beach and going to the pools and seeing what what's there you could dig up strange wiggly creatures and that's what i over the years tried to do well maybe we could talk for a second about the uh, the the technique you used in putzi kite and other pieces as well because it comes up in uh, in the guitar concerto as well in, in shadow time uh, the idea of, of composing a piece in X number of tiny uh, self-contained units, more or less self-contained units, right? That uh, are essentially non sequiturs. And then sort of plotting that out in advance. So you know that it, at bar 183 or whatever, you need to have a duet for a guitar and, and bongos or whatever it might be. Like in a piece like that, you're basically dealing with a completely memoryless structure, right? There's no sense of the, uh, the accumulative potential of material exactly because it, it, it keeps leaping from one shard-like instant to the next. And I wonder, just from a, a purely pragmatic perspective, how you can write a piece of that sort and keep it engaging from beginning to end. Because I find that those works are engaging from beginning to end, but it's, it's, not, it's not obvious that that strategy would work. No, it's not, is it? Um, but a lot of pieces which try to be continuous end up being discontinuous. So I don't see why you shouldn't try the opposite. <laughs> um, I'm not trying to create a... Oh, there was a critic once. Uh, he didn't, doesn't like my music, so you shouldn't worry about that. But uh, He said, well, I've listened to this piece five times now, and I think I'm beginning to discern the form. Uh-huh. Closest card, form. Oh, interesting. <laughs> so people... Um, Certainly the guitar concerto is maybe a good example of how this particular way of writing works because I've got two guitars, one to tune the quarter tone rather than the other. And um, that at least keeps the piece going through. And the beginning of each section usually has something to do with the percussive element because the guitar is a percussive plucked instrument. And you have the harp in there and the very violin, cello and various wind instruments and percussion. So I, I think I used more percussion in that little piece than I've ever used in any other piece before. I think it works. I can't say why it works. It just does. And I think I like that it's pretty guide, but I feel that because of the speed at which I was composing the final sections, I didn't really have... I should have taken more risks with respect to the density of the material. I should maybe have brought the density of the material down a little bit. So. Mm. But otherwise, I think it's... Uh, that way of writing 
worked. Of course, the temptation is, no matter what you think, that the old way of writing is going to catch up with you. Oh, God, I've got a six measures segment here to write for solo flute. So you write a nice little segment for solo flute, knowing that it will only last six measures. And that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to write music which ignored the length of the material and the number of measures. Of course, it has to chop off at some point. It reminds me of the strategies used by some poets. So uh, there's a few that, that spring to mind. There's Ted Berrigan, for example, who at the outset of his career uh, wrote a long series of sonnets where he would he would take poems that he felt were unsuccessful and then chop them up. He would take the individual lines and then write connector material that would then go between the lines and he would end up with a poem that was actually very successful. There are, there are poets that, that work with materials where it, the, the process of, of creation is, is totally, uh, you have a, a series of unrelated lines, essentially. And what's interesting is there is sometimes a kind of involuntary consistency to the material that comes out that way. And I, I wonder if that might be, to some extent, what that critic may have been hearing in the piece when he referred to form with respect to Plitzkei, that I mean, there, there's, a, there's going to be some kind of a form that emerges, whether you like it or not. Well, of course, form is there in the, through the form on view of putting something together. Um, but it, it, the beginnings and ends of those segments are so important. It's not so much of what's going on in the middle, but how you start them and how you bring them to an end when they can't go on any longer, but they've got to stop. And uh, of course, I play games sometimes about carrying on single layers of stuff into the next segment. But often I would put silent fermata or a fermata with the three voices singing um, in order to demonstrate that this is not this is not what we would think of as coherent formal continuity. Talking of the poet uh, Berrigan, my sonatas for string quartet works like that, of course. That I wrote, I was going to write five movements. I wrote two and a half and a bit of another, and. Um, What's the point? I didn't understand why. Why different movements? Why discontin discontinuities or seeming discontinuities had to be painted over, wiped it out? And so what I did finally was um, chop up these movements, space them throughout the composition. Luckily, they were fairly recognizable. Space bits of them in all sorts of different places, and then my continuous ways of bringing these things together. So there were 24 movements, were there? And some of them were just original material, but mostly they were material which tries to ally two or more types of already extant material into a new fictional unity. It's a fascinating strategy. I mean, I, I want to come back once once again to, to Plissichkeit, because it sounds like, in a certain sense, that the, the perspectival energy idea of some of the earlier pieces and the, and the Cacciari pieces can't really function in a piece like that because you have these short little windows within which to operate. But at the same time, the, the point at which one fragment ends and another begins offers you an opportunity to have a kind of energetic encounter, let's say, between two, two materials pushing away from each other, or at least that the differences between one section and the next can, uh, can create a kind of uh, energy that, that keeps the, the piece uh, carrying forward. Yeah, it's, it's a bit tightrope walking. You have to be sure that the style of the music of all of the segments, no matter how different, is at least to some extent able to intermingle and work with the others at any given moment. And so you're, you're playing games. Um, I, puns play a big role for me in music. Something sounds like something else, but isn't. And uh, certainly in Plutzischkeit, a large number of musical puns are happening when sections are ending and others are beginning. And of course, uh, the weird instrumentation of, of Flissi's Guide is very helpful in that uh, I have all these strange brass instruments, which the, the two soprano trombones and the bass trumpet and the, not the tuba, but the... Anyway, uh, and so, but if you, if you look at Flissi's Guide, you find there's a joke in there also, that uh, just the Stockhausen put in three segments which are not contained in the original formulaic structure. So I also put in three segments. First one is just for brass. Uh, the second one is for strings and harps. 
And the third one is for woodwind, piano and percussion. So I had no justification for that whatsoever. I apologize. I just like the sound of the low brass instrument. Well, I, th I think one of the things that makes those pieces as uh, engaging to listen to as they are is the, the the sort of plastic aspect of the sound, the instrumental aspect, let's say, is uh, is constantly being renewed. I mean, you mentioned the vast number of percussion instruments in the guitar concerto, where practically every section has a new group of percussion instruments that suddenly appears out of nowhere, uh, and then generally doesn't reappear also. So uh, there's a, a constant form of re re-energization, I suppose, if I can uh, point a neologism, that uh, is, is constantly happening in that piece. That's right, yes. I should also say that the material of that piece is not entirely original. Lots of my pieces do that. There was the, the song number, almost solo song, there's no real instrumental, number six in, in, in Etude Transcendental. Um, its solo material takes up rhythmic structures that have been worked out for something else in my true concerto, and in the same cycle, of course. And the same is true here, that the uh, rhythmic structures available to me in the guitar concerto are, in fact, transcriptions of certain of the passages in the, uh, the second of the three pieces for piano there. And they were written out in not with the original pictures or anything, or even the original contours, but as shapes. It's how many of these things belong together? Yeah? And I'd got this way of working. Uh, I said, OK, begin at measure 317, transcribe three beats. Begin at measure 20, minus the first beat, transcribe five beats. And so you get the, this rigorous discontinuity, but similarity because of the general flow of the material and of the instrumental colors, which I think works very well in that piece. Well, there's Chronos um, Ion. I'm not sure. Uh, a lot of the same way. Well, Chronos Ion is, um, is, a, is, I think, um, a, 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 not an exception. Chronos Ion, of course, does exhibit many different sorts of sonic texture, uh, harmonic patterns particularly. Um, I think it works on the whole. The thing that doesn't work, why am I talking about pieces which don't work. All right. Uh, <laughs> the thing that one has to be careful, be careful of, is when you're moving from temporal stratification, dis disjunction, to sustained multi-layered activity, which is what the piece is doing. Um, I should have started it a bit earlier, I think, but um, I'm not quite satisfied with the ending of the piece. The, the last few pages, I feel, don't they have not been prefigured enough early enough in the piece. So it's a very long piece, of course, so it's very difficult to sometimes work these things out. I like it. It's one of my favorite pieces, actually. Yeah, I'm struck because you've said on a, on two occasions now that there were, there were aspects of uh, Konos, Ion, and also of, uh, of Blutlichkeit that had you had more time, uh, you would have done differently, and you've expressed a, a measure of dissatisfaction with these aspects of the pieces. Yeah, but I might not... Particularly with Prisley Kite, I might never have finished the piece. Right. I mean, there's a large number of pages and a large number of notes, and it's good to get it finished. And what the, the instrumental instructions give me is a series of instruments taken from the orchestra, between one and full orchestra, in the order in which they have to enter. So it might say half one, bass trombone, double bass. And it's up to me then to look at the rhythmic structuring, the rhythmic structuring being a book length, a 24 layer reworking of certain basic principles and look to see what rhythms I would use. So it's not as if I'm using all the rhythms all the time. And what I ought to have done on occasion would have been to want to, to obey my internal instincts a bit more, which was when an instrument has entered, it doesn't have to play until the end of the segment. At the beginning, that's not true, for instance, whereas later on, after the final one of these three inserts, I think the instrumentation once chosen remains fairly constant for the whole segment. And that's working a little bit against my, my discontinuity principle. Yeah, and in a sense, it's, it's, 
it's surprisingly difficult to create a genuine sense of discontinuity, as I've discovered myself. <laughs> well, that's absolutely <laughs> right. Of course, you've got, but the reason for that is you've got to have damn well created a sense of continuity, which you can recognize and utilize in order to break it. Hmm. You can't say, well, I, I think I'll, I'll write a little fragment today. What you mean is something very short. A fragment of what? And the same is true here. That you've got to have something in the material which insists upon going on, but it's not allowed to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just as in paintings. Look, look at the paintings of uh, Francis Bacon with his old master complex. He insists on all these paintings being enveloped in 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 curly cued gilt sort of 18th century frames and all glassed in you can't actually touch the picture or really get up to close it's got to be something like that it's got to be something which is so continuous in your own self that you can uh, disregard it positively shall i put it like that right so there has to be an implied continuity that is, that is that is actually interrupted and in order to have a fragment you have to actually take something whole and break it uh, so, yeah. oh, I was going to say, I once had a theory of completed fragments. In my youth, I did a lot of analysis of early paper and papers. And, of course, the Opus 9 being very problematic, seemingly not so problematic, but in fact very problematic. I analysed uh, those pieces. And the problem there is that whilst the pieces are of fragment length, most of the forms of them are not closely enough related to the internal in, in interstitial workings of the material to escape the assumption of certain sorts of classical form. I call it the reprise problem in that particular work, that only the sixth movement escapes this particular issue of form and process being imposed upon the material. You take the first piece, it's wonderful how you see uh, how how they even uh, spatialized his sounds and the the, uh, the rhythmic structure which begins on a triplet what silent triplet then what's he doing but at the same time that first piece it, it's almost finished in the first three measures then you go on to um, a climax a couple of measures and then you have um uh, what I suppose is meant to be a sort of recapitulation, but the, all the energy has gone out of it. And I, I, it's wonderful music, but I simply feel that, that the only the sixth piece interlocks all these aspects of the music together. Mm. Uh, there is a form, but it isn't a, for, a form that we're imposing upon it. It's a form which itself is manifesting. Yeah, it strikes me that a lot of the early instrumental miniatures of that period, uh, the violin and piano pieces, the, certainly the Drei kleine Stücke, have basically totally functioning classical uh, forms, usually ABA type of forms. And where he starts to get away from that, actually, I think, is in the vocal pieces of the middle period, particularly things like Opus 18 and Opus 19, where the formal envelope becomes completely insane in a certain sense. It's, it's totally inadequate to the material itself, uh, where well, that's have... absolutely true. Yes, but you you think why did people at that time write tone poems? They wrote tone poems because there were forms or layouts of narrative structure there which they could fit their music into. And I don't think that uh, Opus eighteen and Opus nineteen of by Weber are any, very different. They they also move somewhat in the agogic realm. Of the of the vocal parts, although I must say the the nature of the vocal parts is so extraordinarily discrepant with respect to the workings of the instruments that there is almost an entirely new formal sense created by itself there that they don't belong in any way together. Yeah, it's it's fascinating how he would take these naive sort of rural folk poems written in Austrian dialect. And, and set them in the most insane way you could possibly imagine. But then at the same time, there's, a, there's an explicit 
sort of folk component to those pieces, owing to the instrumentation, the use of the E flat clarinet and guitar together with the soprano. I mean, it's it's a it's a surpassingly strange piece, I think, on on many levels. I'm totally fascinated by it personally. Oh yes, the works of that period are are just amazing. And then of course you come into the string trio, which is a strange work in itself. It was supposed to have a third movement. Uh, Opus 24 was supposed to, uh, has a third movement and shouldn't have had. The symphony was supposed to have had a third movement. So we can see that Weber is still adhering to some extent to principles not of Renaissance polyphony only, but of quite classical music, 17th, 18th century music. And I think that the songs that you mentioned are very good. Uh, it doesn't work like that because they're so, there are so many disjunct levels working at the same time. I wanted to uh, bring up another area in this conversation, which is the, uh, you might say, the, uh, the relationship between Europe and the United States in your own life, uh, and also with respect to your practice. I read in an interview once, you said something along the line, paraphrasing, but something along the lines that at the time when you left Europe, uh, you felt dismayed at the way things were going in terms of the music world. And then uh, I'm assuming that you you viewed the situation in the United States more positively. This is, I believe, around 1995. And correct me if I've got this wrong. I'm interested uh, in just just knowing a little bit more about yeah. that. What what was it that you found dismaying in the European music world at that time? I think it had to do partly with the with my um, dislike of overt politicizing in in artworks, and much of it was this political thing. And I, whilst the composers may or may not be as good as, as we wish, the, um, many of them ex presumed that insiders would understand the sort of things they were doing in their music as political statements. And I didn't think this was basically very true at all. Uh, and I felt that there was a certain academicism coming in, which I didn't like. And I didn't know a great deal about music, American music at the time. I mean, look, I knew Carter, I knew uh, Rochberg, I knew um, uh, Warren, Roger Reynolds, people like that, people of a certain generation. And um, what I found interesting more than the already composed music was the way comp composers sprouted up that one day they'd be doing a garage band somewhere and the next day they'd be coming to do uh, graduate studies in composition and they didn't seem to see that as a con as a, as a conflict <laughs> i had to get used to that um but oh, they were very open-minded and eager to learn and so i felt that the maybe the path that european composition teaching had, had adopted was a little bit too self-satisfied. Mm -hmm. So it was nice to come to a place where, uh, even if I couldn't stand all the music, where there were thoughts thought that I hadn't thought myself. It's interesting because, you, I mean, you used the word academic, it was becoming academic. Whereas one thing mm. that strikes me is that in the European system generally, although it's starting, I mean, it's been changing now for some time, but uh, in, in a general mm -hmm. sense, uh, composition is mainly taught in conservatories, which tend to have a, a more uh, hands-on, uh, pragmatic approach to teaching composition, to teaching theory, to teaching instruments in general. In America, composition teaching takes place within academia for the most part. So one could imagine that the, the world of academia in North America would lend itself more easily to academicism uh, than would be the more sort of hands-on European conservatory style approach. But it sounds like you haven't found that to be the case. Well, it's very interesting. Um, it's a big subject, but the reason that American serialism came about was because it was important for composers to earn a living, a PhD, so academe. But you had no, it didn't matter how good or bad the music was. You had to be able to justify it in theoretical writings. Certainly that was true of Milton Babbitt, for instance and others as well. And so um, it became a sort of a default way of musical thinking that numerology and various 
uh, things of that sort would would be analyzable. You wrote, write them down, and you yes, you get a PhD on that basis. Whereas I think for a long time, when I first came to the stage, even though I taught at UCSD, which was more open in that respect, um, you every couple of years you had to write a long letter to the deans saying why creative music had a place in universities. And, you know, well, I did that. Uh, unfortunately, now this is no longer the case. But apart from one or two schools, I, I think that composition will very often not be taught at all anymore. Mm. And so it's back to conservatories. I think certainly it's some of the major universities, I believe universities, have abandoned or are in the process of abandoning creative compositional studies as a subject. I mean, shoehorning composition into the framework of research is always going to be an awkward fit. So when you have to write those sorts of letters justifying your activity in terms of mm -hmm. research, I mean, it, it's a, it, you, could, you could say it's a hard case to make. So on, on one level, I suppose that's understandable because it's not clear that composition actually belongs in academia. Yes, that's right. Um, all two, at least two generations of American composers um, bought into this sort of total serialism thing because uh, Milton Babbitt needed them um, to have material which could be evaluated by non-musicians. Hmm. If composition teaching in America is to continue, which I wouldn't like to predict, um, it will surely now be in the hands of the conservatories to to propagate it. Mm -hmm. Or in the hands of those universities which have a music school attached. Well, how how do you see the situation evolving in Europe now when you when you come back over here? I mean, is it is it still the case that you're seeing manifestations of these sorts of tendencies or is it improving at all it, it seems to me that and I, i'd really like to get your perspective on this that there it, it's very hard to pinpoint any kind of particular consistency or coherent coherency in the different strands that are being practiced currently uh I, i'm seeing well, yes, a lot that's of absolutely that's absolutely right i see when i go to darmstadt and i teach God knows how many, 80 pupils or something. I see a lot of thought. And um, yes, some countries have a consistency of style, mainly because there are the, China, for instance, mainly because most of the pupils come from Shanghai. And there is, there is a way of writing in Shanghai, which you don't have to like or dislike it, but it's you can judge its quality as is, as it were, what, what, what they do with it. Um, Russia has some very strange people that I sometimes burst out laughing when I, I saw some of the videos of these pieces. I wonder if the present generation of, of higher middle-aged composers isn't really going to be the last generation uh, of independent composers. I think the younger ones are going to be uh, in much more difficulty in order to make actual composed pieces part of the cultural scene. It's interesting because more and more composers. Uh, when I started teaching composition, there were not so many. Now there are hundreds and hundreds of them. And one wonders, is that a sign of health or of sickness? Can't answer it for you. I've often wondered the same thing myself. Uh, mm. it's, it's, it's not clear. You have to think of it also in terms of, of prospects also. Uh, this was something that Morton Feldman actually started to say with increasing mm, stridency towards the end of his life, was that basically mm -hmm. most of the people that he saw, I, I don't know if he was referring to his own graduate students, but he was saying that most of the things he was seeing were coming from people that probably should really do something else. Uh, and there was mm. a, a vast increase in the number of students uh, and this was around the late 1980s. I think he died in 1987. Yes. I think that's true. Um, I taught some wonderful people at Stanford. Really, really good people. And a few of them got really good jobs. I have to say, thank you very much. That was good. 
but some of them are still struggling. And I think their music is is exceptionally good. And their brains are suited to talking about these things with other people. Mm -hmm. And so I think the present generation may well be the last of, um, at least in America, of people doing doing primarily composition. I hope not. But I think the world has been changing. The world is changing. The um, academic scene is recalibrating itself to other concerns. And I don't know to what extent the the living arts, in the sense we know them, are going to be promulgated anymore. But I'm just an old skeptic. So. <laughs> well, uh, the hope I have is that uh, the vast increase in availability of um, radical new technologies and the emergence of, uh, of these gigantic platforms like YouTube, uh, the ease with which the younger generation uh, is able to uh, connect with each other virtually. Uh, the the fact I'm seeing a lot of younger composers starting their own ensembles. They're basically having to do everything from scratch. Also, because the institutional infrastructure that's in place in Europe is getting weaker and weaker, so they're, they're they have to do these things by themselves. Indeed, that's right. In Europe, it's reached the crisis point. I think almost. Yeah, in in some countries more than others, but France has become a virtual desert. In that sense, uh, and in the twenty years that I've been living here, I've seen a. Well, Ger a vast Germany is scrabbling to, to its credit. It's scrabbling to keep things together, mm. but I don't know. Yeah, but but it it is we're seeing the emergence of a new type of composer that's more comfortable with taking enormous amounts of initiative in terms of uh, plotting entirely individual career paths that. Yeah, are sometimes quite remarkable. It's a, it's an extremely difficult path. It's very uh, it's it's a very tenuous one because there's no security in that whatsoever. But nevertheless, there's a sense that you have to find a way. And I think that highly gifted individuals, uh, highly creative people, will mm -hmm. find a way. You know. Oh, I'm sure that's nearly always the case. If their personalities don't speak against it, it could be the case. Uh, yes, I've seen many people who have um, done works, quasi-works, uh, of music theatre and um, pieces to be performed together with un other people's uh, artistic activity. Of course, all these things are very good. I won't now sound finish this off by sounding too skeptical. Of course, Many of the people working in these areas have remarkable minds, and remarkable minds people like me at my age don't have access to in a creative way. So I'm, I'm certainly as, as optimistic as you in that respect. Whether that's music that will get out there is another matter. That seems like a good place to, to end the conversation. Um, I truly appreciate your taking the time. Uh, this has been very enjoyable, very stimulating. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you for listening to my moanings. <laughs> if you like what I do, you can help me to keep on doing it by becoming a patron of my YouTube channel and podcast. It's easy and fast, and you can do it for as little as $5 a month. Rewards include exclusive downloads, books, CDs, and more. I also offer personalized composition and analysis lessons on Zoom. For more information, check the links in the video description.